What's up guys, welcome to another episode of Poker Coaching. My name is Lex Veldhuis and today we're gonna do something different. I'm very excited about this. We're gonna go uh, from a tournament start to finish, the 5.30 marathon, tough tournament on PokerStars, playing against the best in the world. And we're gonna be scrutinized for every single decision that we make. So follow along and see if you get it right. All right, 5.30 marathon started. Uh, as soon as one of the main tables busts, I'm gonna pull it on screen. I just don't really feel like Getting it in, getting it out, getting it in, getting it out. Ooh. Oh, look at that. Easy call. I feel like sometimes I'm too hard on myself in terms of... Uh, sometimes I feel I'm too hard on myself in terms of uh, poker, right? I don't have the time to study like other regulars do because of streaming and commitments and shit like that. Absolutely fine in terms of my career um also you know that helps let me just play this bot. uh two and a half x so that would be what this yeah. all right so it's important to go over every single hand so let's just do this one from start to finish we won't miss anything and uh, we'll see what you're doing yeah, because I, I think it's important too, because like sometimes if I pick a spot, I, you know, I'm not always going to know what I'm not sure about. And I think this way there's no hiding, you know, there's going to be lots of mistakes, maybe some pre-flop nittiness that you're going to spot. So I think it's really good to get the kinks out. Let's do it. Yeah. Playing big pots early. This yeah. is obviously very standard. So what are you thinking about now? So we had that spot a few weeks ago where we had a 10% pot bet. I like it better on the turn because you sort of like get to a free showdown, which doesn't happen now, right? Like if I want to force like a turn, but I still, I thought it was interesting. Um, not necessarily check if give, give away equity. I am probably going to realize my full equity because I do get to check to the river. And I think with a heart in my hand, that's kind of nice. I think that the stack to pot ratio is still in a way where I can comfortably get good hands in betting the flop like this. So I don't think I uh, take away my ability to get stacks in when I do have the nuts. So I think it's, I don't know, it's kind of like a cute bet that I wanted to try. And I was actually, you know, I'm actually happy we talk about it because I, I don't know if I'm applying it right. You are. Yeah, this, this works. Uh, I like this bet in these types of scenarios. Um, this looks really good. Checking is an option. It's better to check when you don't have a heart. Um, but yeah, this looks good. Okay, cool. Because uh, we we saw that one guy do it, and you know, it's it's stuck with me since. And I'm I'm I was just happy to notice it because I, you know, I yeah okay. Yeah, nice. Uh, boom. <laughs> yeah, it's a good car. All right, so now my plan is just you know now I think I need to think about uh, geometric sizing, uh, put some pressure. Obviously, I can put a ton of pressure on either like. Um, I mean, he's, he's going to have to call against that bet. Probably some high cards that don't have a heart in it. Or even, you know, a hand like uh, tens, nines, uh, jack ten of spades. Like it's, I think it's good to start applying some pressure uh, here. I agree. I think this bet's... <clears throat> uh, I don't know about calling with... <clears throat> excuse me. High card hands that don't have a heart. But this, this bet still works. Like, it's still good. This is the same sizing choice-ish that I would use. You could maybe even go a little bit smaller. Um, and then... Uh, but yeah, I, I like this. So this looks good to me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One answer. Yeah, so very easy. Nice start to the tournament. Good so far. Oh. Yeah, so thoughts? That's a big bet. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so he's super short. That's the... Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, anything I make full there is huge profits. So what are you thinking about already from, from, from Go here? I mean, insanely deep. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not really folding many suited hands, as you can tell, because this is the second worst one. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's correct, though, to just auto defend. But I feel like if I'm going to defend to a min raise versus any position on the table, then I'm sure as hell going to defend big blind for small blind this deep. Yeah, I mean, there are some hands that you can defend versus some min-raise that you're going to fold here, but I do think that you, you want to defend. Uh, I think it's 100% of the suited ones here, so I would call two, so I okay. like it. And this is like pretty much a one-option scenario. Yeah. So what do you think about here? I think that like bet sizing is obviously my main concern. 
Um, I'm thinking a little bit about like if I want to have bigger, what if I would have like small bets and bigger bets, or if I'm just like betting sort of like at a singular size and just pick like 66% or something to, you know, that falls out equity, still gets value, builds a pot, whatever. Um, I mean, I, I think one of my main concerns here in general would be equity denial, I think, right? And obviously getting value. Um, but I've, I kind of I went with a sort of like si one size that fits all kind of approach here. Yeah, you kind of went with the stuck in the middle size, in my opinion. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan. I think I, I do actually think that you're very clever though, because I think you figure. So I, I like your uh, the way you thought it, thought it through. Um, I like the way that you reached the conclusion of a big part of this being equity denial. So when I think about this scenario, he three and a half x pre, which pulls out basically all of the offsuit threes from your range. So you don't have a three much. I mean, you've got two suited ones per per combo, um, which is like twenty four threes right and like minus the ones that you three bet pre-flop which it's not a bad reason uh region to three bet from either because when we three bet in position we usually three bet polar so you know if you want something suited a suited three is actually not a bad way to do it mm -hmm. so you don't have a three i get it you do have a three right but you but you don't really have a three so your value betting range here is mostly a seven or a five and you know you also have some over pairs here interestingly enough like um uh, you don't really three bet. You don't need to three bet all of your over pairs pre flop here. You could two bet a lot of them on the flop, but it's not stupid to call some of them. So it's possible that you still have an over pair. But for the most part, right, we're going to have a pair of sevens uh, and then to a lesser extent, a pair of fives. So, you know, by and large, you're going to be like protection betting here, given like the bet plus check. So I think like a smaller size is uh, is actually really appropriate. And it's not as easy to find because intuitively you're like i have trips i want to get stacks in given how deep we are i need to bet big yeah. that's pretty logical but mostly you don't have trips when you think about your range mostly mm -hmm. your range is just like a value protection bet that really want to take wants to take advantage of this guy that's kind of polar which means he'll probably have a high fold percentage and the reason i say kind of polar is because he raised preflop pretty big um, which is mostly a linear range, actually. But then he bets the flop on a low card board, which is not necessarily the greatest for, for either of us. We don't have a lot of interaction. And then he elects not to barrel. And a lot of his, his value bets also need protection, right? Like if he has a, a good seven, eights, nines, tens, those hands, they all want to, they all want to barrel. So, yeah, if you, when, you, when you use a small bet, it's very efficient because in this scenario, he definitely is going to have to defend high card hands given uh, after, his, after his check. He cannot just defend here with pairs. And so you can put a lot of pressure on a range like that with like small to mid-sized bets. And again, keeping in mind that your range is mostly a pair of sevens or a pair of fives. I really like a protection-oriented sizing here. Um, this is kind of like that, but, um, but yeah, yeah. I, I like, I like a, a smaller size. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of like, I, I pretty much have, I can't make a big bet bucket because... I have so much I, I don't have enough nuts. And then if I would if I would put my nuts in the big bed bucket, then the small bed bucket gets so weak that I'm just gonna get pounded. And that's why that's why I just need to sort of like make the smaller bet my range bet. Because then I'm denying equity. I can still bet more, right? Like I can't just start betting five K here with like King Five. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. how I think about it too. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. So what are you thinking about in a situation like this one? Um, I think, I mean, obviously I'm checking vector flush draws are very important. And uh, vector flush draws, vector straight draws, and what cards, let's say, let's say it's ace-jack deuce with two diamonds and I'm considering more calling because I have the seven and I have the four into backdoor, backdoor straight draws, but like I can't even, I don't even draw to an eight, so then I'm just out. So I think that's, my interaction with the middle and bottom card on the board are very important in terms of if, if, my, if I have over cards to those. All right. Um, this is a call. Whoa. Um, which sucks. Well, I mean, it's not like I love calling here. I'm not jumping up and down about it or anything. <laughs> yes. but, <Yeah. laughs> um, and it's, it's close enough that like if you had a club, you would fold. 
right? So if, if we have a club in our hand, like if we have seven four four of clubs, you're going to block the backdoor flush draw bets here, which which is which is kind of problematic. We block some of the weaker hands that this player should be stabbing with. This player should also be stabbing with one club hands uh, as opposed to total air, because the one club hands here block your backdoor flush draw, so they have a slightly higher probability of forcing you to a fold. Um, so having a club in your hand actually su kind of sucks. It blocks the weaker parts of this player's range. So you would fold here, I think, with seven four with the four of clubs, but this one's a goal, I think. Um, and you've got to call the counter this far down. Uh, it's really close, though. Like, I think that, like, I don't know, seven deuce is probably still full. So, um, like, you don't you don't play all the seven of diamonds combos, but I think that this is, like, kind of a decent one with some backdoor straight draw possibilities. So, um, well, yeah. I mean, I would have folded, yeah, I would have folded seven five, which is probably, which is even worse because it has better connectivity to, like, the eight if a six comes, et cetera. So, yeah, mm -hmm. but it doesn't sound like you would have folded, like, nine four, right? That would you, I don't no. know if you would have or not. No. So, like, nine you're not making that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so you're not making that many folds that are bad, right? Like, it's, not, it's not that big of a deal. Decent flop. Murstucky or Murf45 AK1. <laughs> That'd be the boomer way of pronouncing things. Not going anywhere. Okay, so I mean, like, yeah, are you thinking about Limpre raising it all here, or, or is this just, mm, you know? No, really. I kind of, I kind of just like. The, I mean, when it gets this deep, it's probably good to have some Limpre raises with some. Okay, so the way I would look at it, probably thinking about it logically now, is like, if we're like forty big blinds deep, I would never want to. Uh, well, I would not really want to limp re-raise with my suited hands because I don't want to get blown off my equity by 4-bet shove. Whereas I think the deeper we get, and I w like, it is a little bit less appetizing to limp raise a hand like King-7 off because we're going to get called a lot because we're so deep. So now I think we revert back to some playability. So I do think that some of the Ace-4, Ace-5, Ace-3 region comes back into limp raises. Yeah, so this hand does limp call. I wasn't trying to set you up. <laughs> this hand does limp call. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I'm, I'm just saying, like, I, I do technically, I, in general, I just limp call all my suited stuff. And if I want to add some uh, bluffs to the mix, um, I, I do. I use the offsuit block. But um, I, I just thought, like, being this deep, um, you know, 70 big blinds deep, I figured that maybe I need to add some more suited stuff. But maybe that comes more from, like, the king deuce, king three suited region or something. Yeah, so this scenario... In, in my my understanding of No Limit, works like kind of like this. So the, the imposition player wants to generally be polar. The reason they're polar, they have a good reason, the reason they're polar is uh, they're in position. And so you want to try to negate their positional advantage by uh, re-raising preflop. That's, that's like technically like one of the incentives, even though a lot of people hate doing it and don't do it very well. You want to be aggressive from the small line because you're out of position and you can negate that positional advantage by continuing to put aggression onto your, to your opponent. Because they're in position, um, they want to defend by calling because that's that allows them to exercise that positional advantage. Okay, so as a result of the fact that they have a bias towards calling, when you get to the point where yeah they can flat comfortably, you kind of have to go a little bit linear. So you're going to see hands at this stack depth like seven six suited here, the limp three limp three bets eight seven suited nine eight suited ten nine suited. Um, now you, at the same time you want to make sure you don't uh, limp limp re raise with so much equity. But if you get jammed on, you're just like, you know, you're going to cry about it, kind of. <laughs> so you don't typically see hands like queen-jack suited or king-jack suited here. Um, I don't think you use the suited ace-x block, the suited wheel block, but you do use some hands like king-7 suited, um, like queen-8 suited, jack-8 suited, etc. That's good to know. Yeah, cool. All right. So we called here. Were you thinking about check-raising at all, or is this just like a call-fold spot for you? How are you thinking about it now? I think the one cool thing about check-raising could be that you can fold out some better ace-highs. Uh, here, but I think that generally my auto is to just check call, pretty much never folding. Yeah, I don't think we have a. I don't. I don't. We're not folding. That's like that's a, that's an easy part. Um, yeah. I'm not sure about check raising. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe check raising is good. I I just it seems really close. I don't really check raise much against this sizing choice. I think against this sizing choice, I'd rather be more polar. Um, so I'd rather have like maybe king four of clubs or something. Seems like a hand that could make sense for you. Yeah. Um, Dan like maybe introduces a barreling opportunity. He's gonna have great equity if he calls my check raise. Uh, but then if I happen to get three bet off by like pocket tens, I'm not like 
a wounded animal about it. It's okay. You know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. All right. So we get here. We, we, we check the turn, which I think is fairly normal. And uh, why don't you walk me through what you're thinking about now? Okay, so his size starts suggesting a little bit less, less of a polar part of his range. Um, I mean, I feel super comfortable, but I don't think it's like, uh, like high fives around the room. Let's go to town with his hands, you know? So I honestly think that, um, I mean, I think it would be, if I have hands like Ace-Jack or Ace-10, I think we can start considering uh, or uh, introducing some check raises, but I just don't really see how I'm going to build a big pot with this hand and, and be happy about the showdown, you know? So I just feel like check calling is appropriate. I think it's also a really good barrel card for them. I want to have some Ace-X. Uh, in my check calling range to you know to keep being to be balanced in that uh, in that part of the sequence. So, mm. so most of what you said was really good. Some of it wasn't perfect. You're gonna have a, you're gonna be pretty short Ace Ten. I think um, this is like a pretty big bet. It's not gonna pull out all of the Ace Ten, but it's not gonna leave you with all of the Ace Ten either. Like you're not you're not gonna have most probably of your Ace Ten. And you also I don't know if you're are you using a raising range preflop at all. Uh, yeah. Or do you limp the whole no, thing? No, no. I, I, if, yeah. I mean, if I, if I get close to 100 big blinds, then I'm I'm very close to, like, pure limping. Yeah. Same strategy I'm using. You're just, I just wanted to make sure that you're using the same preflop strategy I'm using. So, I mean, like, the the hands, like, you know, Ace-10 suited, Ace-Jack suited, they're usually missing. So you're not going to have the suited ones. So you're not going to have, like, the backdoor flush draw variations to check all this flop because um, they're mostly in the raising range preflop. And then, yeah, like, Ace-10 and Ace-Jack, like, against the bet of this size, um... They, they mostly fold, I think. Uh, they call sometimes, but they fold a lot, I think. Mm. Um, so so then we get, we, we check call, like whatever. We get here, and we don't really have much ace 10 or ace jack to check raise with. Like we have a non zero amount, but not much. And the thing is also that this player, I don't really buy this. Um, I, let me rephrase that. I don't buy that this is balanced. I think that this is constructed the way that he's telling me it's going to try. Like these, this is like a very, this is a situation where he has to be a very high level player, like super high level to keep this straight. So what's happening, right? So okay, let's go, let's go. Let's all, all the way from the beginning. So he isolates you preflop. Okay, fine. He's got a strong range for doing that. He can have a bunch of bullshit hands too. Okay, fine. He uses a really large in position flop bet. Now this flop bet makes sense. That's fine. But it's usually not very dense ace high. It's usually much more dense. Like jack 10 is a bluff. Queen 10, queen jack is bluffs. Maybe something with a forward and like a backdoor flush draw, like maybe jack four suited if he was buffing pre. Maybe even a hand like... Uh, like a like a like a like a queen six off or something maybe sometimes and then it's like a lot of nine x when he has it which is not that easy but maybe like ace nine or something and then a lot of like pocket tens pocket jacks pocket queens pocket kings pocket you know whatever um it's going to be a lot less dense ace highs generally speaking it's just a big bet right so big bets to, you know on a board like they'll, they'll tend to check or they'll tend to bet smaller or whatever so that's just like the way i think this is naturally shaped and those combos will be naturally overweight unless this player is being really thoughtful about including ace highs in the range then then they they bet 40 percent in position on like a relatively in a situation where maybe they should be a little bit more polar or something so what does this tell me like this is like okay he's, you know he's probably barreling like tens and jacks and, and queens and maybe king nine or something and this is not the size and choice they do to choose in my opinion more likely than not if he had ace x so if this player is this player is either like and this is not a situation that comes up super frequently so it's not very well studied so i just believe that this player has like tens or bust like, I, I just think that there are like nine, you know, king nine or something. I just don't believe that this is like a well-constructed ace jack being really thoughtful about the fact that it's representing an underpair to the ace here. Um, and it's, and again, this player just doesn't have much interaction with his ace to begin with. So I, th I do think that I would check race here um, because I would just be like, oh, you have tens. And like, I'll just be like, mm -hmm. screw you. And then I would just check race. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Like, we just, we can just go to value it down. And it's not like I have a whole lot of ace x either. So yeah you know it's, it's it's like we both don't have a great connection to this card which means i can go for some more marginal value when i do have it yeah and like the, you know you're gonna have to call this hand too right which was another point you made which is like i don't you know I, i'm gonna have um i'm not gonna have that much ace x um and so like this hand can you know calling with, with this is not stupid but i think that this player's like i think it, very often this player's kind of flipped his hand face up um maybe as like I think a cool hand for this player to have that would like might own you would be like ace nine, right? Where he's like, mm -hmm. oh shoot, like now I have like a bunch of board, like I have too much of the board. Like now I'm going to just make it small or maybe it's pocket aces, right? But like you block both of those pretty heavily. So yeah, yeah I mean, like I, I, would, I would probably check race here. So he called, diamonds come in, obviously we check. 
checks and he has yeah so he has no yeah. pair so this, this is kind of like what it, it felt a lot like this and it just it's just hard for him to be being like really thoughtful about including this part because again it kind of requires a multi-step component to this which is like he has to bet really big on the flop with the ace x block which i don't think is super likely and then he has to be aware enough that he did that to then under bet the the ace x block representing the tens component of his range and i i, 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 I think it's just easier to have tens <laughs> it's just yeah. easier to have tens so um yeah uh, okay yeah, it makes a lot of sense i try i try no that's really interesting yeah okay it's just fine it's fine too sure it's okay. You can just keep going. All right. So we face another uh, race first in this time. We're in position we call. Pretty good. So again, how do you think about three betting here? I mean, again, like, I just, like, it's, it's a bit hard to me because it's like 60 bigs deep. If it's like, if it's like 40 bigs, I'll, 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 like, I'll, I'll go more towards like queen, six, queen, seven, three bets, king, four, king, five off, you know, those kind of sort of like offsuit ones. Maybe three bets, some ace deuce, ace three off, something like that. And obviously, like linear value, but and then maybe like mix in sort of like a five seven suited component. All right, so uh, we're in position. Uh, we do, you know, we spoke a little bit about this earlier. So, uh, so we're in position. So that means that we're going to want to be a little bit more polar because this our opponent is going to have a natural incentive to to re raise pre flop. Okay, so just positionally speaking. If we're the imposition player, we have an incentive to call. I mean, obviously, we have to have we have we have aces for re-raising, so we have to think about how to bluff. Just because we have an incentive to call is when we can't re-raise as a bluff. So we have aces, kings, queens, jacks. Those hands all re-raise pre-flop. We have ace, king, ace, queen. Those hands re-raise pre-flop. Okay, so we have a three betting range. Once we have a three betting range, we have to offset it with some bluffs. Now, um, our opponent has a natural incentive to positional incentive to four bet us pre-flop, and we can negate that tendency by polarizing our range. Okay, so by using basically really weak bluffs, we force our opponent into a situation where I know you want to re-raise me, but if you re-raise me, I'm, you're going to re-raise into seven two offs, which is just going to fold, or aces, which is just going to call. Mm -hmm. So we can, we, we can essentially, we can construct our three-bet range in a way that tries to negate his tendency to four-bet us. Okay? So in this situation, all you really have to think about is the perimeter of your, of your continuing strategy. You don't want a three-bet polar and just go to like, the worst combos in the deck, like that, that, you know, some people think when they, I say polar, I mean three bet him with like king two offsuit and queen two offsuit. You know, like you're not playing queen three offsuit, so why would you three bet him with queen two offsuit? But you want to think about the perimeter or the weakest hands that you actually are going to play. And those hands or the hands just below that line are going to be the hands you three bet with. So hands like king four off makes sense. Hands like king five off makes sense. Hands like, and the reason for that is because you can't fold king six, okay? Um, hands like queen seven and queen eight off makes sense. Because you're not going to flat queen six here. It's a fold. Hands like jack seven or jack eight offsuit makes sense. Because you're not going to flat jack six. Hands like queen two and queen, queen three suited. Or ten two and ten three suited. Or jack two and jack three suited. Or king two and king three suited. Or nine two and nine three suited. These very bottom of the suited flatting component. They also make sense. Okay. So this is like, because we're in position, we're not going to use a linear approach. We're going to use a more polar approach. And we're going to uh, constrain the polarized part of our range. To the bottom of the hands that we would normally play. Oh, that's a cool way. I I didn't think about it like that. I didn't think about like picking the like if you were going to be polar, but pick like the bottom hands you're going to play. Like that makes it so much more clear, you know. Yeah. So when you look at a chart, it's helpful to have these kind of strategies for actually understanding what you're looking at. Otherwise, it just looks like a bunch of noise on a screen. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's, it can be super helpful when people like when you're studying on your own to just actually have some kind of orientation of like what is this. So yeah. Um, cool. All right. And then yeah, well, obviously that's not the board we were looking for. Um, Actually, I mean, I'm just thinking about like how many, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for me, this is just like, I continue if there's a club. Yeah, that's easy for sure. Uh, like that's not like, that's that's like, that's a lock. So if you had a club, if there's a club on this board, there's no chance you can fold. Um, the high card hand here will be will be pretty resilient without a club. Uh, like you're gonna have to defend, you're never gonna have to defend queen high hands here. I just don't know if you're gonna have to defend uh, uh, like this far down. Like if you had queen 10, you would definitely call. If you had queen nine, I would call. If I had queen eight, I would. Queen eight suited, obviously, I'm not going to have much of the, the offsuit one. I'd probably still call. Queen three, I think I'd fold. But this is, this is pretty close. This is pretty close. Yeah. Um, so, because this, this board just doesn't give us much to defend with. So, we're going to have to defend some ugly stuff. All right, I think that's a great point to cut it. I hope you really enjoyed this format. We're gonna go on until the tournament's finished. 
Of course, thanks to BBC for all the knowledge. His links are in the description down below. If you appreciate this free knowledge and content, and if this is a good way to study for you, uh, make sure you subscribe, like the video, and comment down below if you have any questions. See you next time.